everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we're talking with Dylan Lang about the Pacific Rim movies, which I liked a lot and I believe Dylan also liked. So initial thoughts, Dylan? Um, I love the first Pacific Rim a ton. I'm a I'm also uh like a what you call a shill for Guillermo del Toro though. I almost love anything he does. Um but I love the first movie a lot. I was disappointed by the second one, but I still think it's a fun movie, and there's a lot of cool references in it to the genre of kaiju that I like. Um, but uh, overall, I think like the soundtrack for the first movie is much stronger, and I like I like a lot of the things from the first movie more. But I I understand why a lot of people like the second one. Okay, yeah. I I don't know why, but I do like the second one better. Um, I don't know if it's because we see the training facility, or I just like John Boyega a lot, or or the fact that we managed to hide the human bad guy for a while. You, they're really pushing you know, a particular bad guy, and it turns out to be somebody else. Um, but uh, I don't know. I just really like the second one. I like, I like a lot of the battle scenes, like the one that's in Sydney. Yeah. So... I love. I, I love one the, of those. I rewatched the second one. <laughs> I love the in the second movie in particular. There's like one of my few disappointments. Disappointments with that movie was like the lack of like robot on monster action. Um, there's a lot more robot on robot, um, but I do love the weird like cyborg kaiju that come and like open up the portal. They were like the the. Uh, the drones that they were developing in the second movie. Uh, I love those designs because they've got like this metal armor and they look like they are kaiju, but in armor. It's just really cool. Um, I also like the weirdness of the second movie with uh, Charlie Day's character. I, I'm a little mixed on him being a villain, um, the scientist, uh, but I, I was cackling and having a good time whenever he's talking to, like, his wife or girlfriend or whatever, and, like, they've kind of made a couple references to her before, and then he gets home, he's talking about his day, and then he puts on this weird head contraption, and then you find out that his girlfriend or wife is one of the brain alien monsters. Uh, it's, it's a brain from one of the kaiju, specifically. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's weird. And I, I can get behind that. I, I like weird things. Um, I like his dialogue, or, too, where he, sometimes he's talking about himself, but sometimes he's talking about himself, and it's not himself. So you get these really yeah. bizarre, <laughs> bizarre utterances from him that are a lot of fun. I think, I, granted, this is Pacific Rim, so they're not going to tackle heavy subjects, but I think one of the missed opportunities of that movie is the uh, child soldier aspect. I think it, they were, it was almost like an Ender's Game setup, but they never explore that idea too fully. It's just, yeah, they're child soldiers. <laughs> um, there's an anime uh, that heavily influenced uh, Pacific Rim, actually, uh, called Evangelion, Neon Genesis Evangelion. And that is a similar subject of these child soldiers who get in giant robots and fight giant monsters but it tackles it almost like 100% straight and it tackles how these ch children have like horrible trauma and anxiety issues. Uh, and so I, I was kind of disappointed that they didn't explore that topic a little bit more, how it's, these are kids with like the weight of the world on their shoulders, mm -hmm. but it's a fun action movie. They don't necessarily need to tackle that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Um, and I hadn't really thought about it before because I think there's a lot of that genre where you end up with the younger, I mean, if it's, you know, Hunger Games or whatever, you somehow you seem to end up yeah. with teenagers saving the world a lot. So, yeah, <laughs> that seems common. Oh, definitely. Um, I think uh, one of my issues with the second Pacific Rim is that it felt a lot more uh, commercial in a way where it, it does feel like they start putting in kid characters because they want to attract kids to the movie, younger people to see the movie. And there's actually a character who was Japanese in the last one. Uh, she was the, the, like, the girlfriend of uh, Charlie Hunnam's character by the end of the movie. Um, and she 
gets killed off pretty unceremoniously in the second movie. And then they push a Chinese actress to be like your new woman character. And that was more than likely a decision to try and cater a little bit to the Chinese audiences. Uh, that's, that, that's a little rampant in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, like uh, if you saw the second Independence Day, all of a sudden they, they, there, was, there was a lot of stuff. I, I agree with the idea that in something like Pacific Rim or Independence Day, you would have the world coming together. I agree with that concept, but it was always like, yeah, China is the one that funded all of this stuff and helped the Americans. And you're like, well, what about all these other countries? Oh, they don't have as big of a, of a middle class, apparently. <laughs> um, well, what but, I first heard when they were recasting things for the second movie, and they're like, oh, they're going to get rid of the Japanese female character, and they're casting Clint Eastwood's kid. And I'm like, <laughs> because everybody has to be white and male? I mean, really? Yeah. But, um, you know, at least they got John Boyega in there, so he's not white. But, you know, he is a guy, so yeah. uh, we, we do kind of scale down some of the female character parts. Definitely, and we also... Well, you do have that little girl, but she doesn't... It, my issue is that, like, she's kind of introduced as one of the main characters, but she then kind of disappears from the movie for a while to focus on John Boyega. Um, <laughs> weird little nitpick I have about that second movie is, in the first movie, you have all these ridiculous names... And Idris Elba's character's name is Stacker Pentecost. And then his son's name is just Jake. <laughs> I, I find that, like, weird. <laughs> um, but it, for me, with the first movie, I like a lot of the characters in that a lot more. Um, but I will say John Boyega is a more interesting main character. Um, I don't think he and um, the Eastwood Coup's first name escapes me at the moment. Uh, do have seem to have a lot of chemistry and the, the, their by play when they're like teasing each other seems to work pretty well. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I think the thing that is missing is in the opening of the first Pacific Rim, you have like from the first Pacific Rim, what's missing is in the opening you have uh, the main character and his brother, like kind of having that same sort of like they got a good charisma with each other playing off of each other. And then he just dies within the first five minutes and you're, like, oh, okay. And the movie is more about this loner trying to get back into, um, like, a, like a, a family aspect. Um, but uh, the first movie has a really sal uh, salad, solid str uh, soundtrack by uh, Rami, R Ramin Jawadi, I think is his name. Uh, the guy that did Game what, of Thrones. World and Game of Thrones, yeah. Yeah. Uh, his soundtrack for that first movie and his the theme that he made is just awesome. It's got these shredding guitars. Um, it's really cool. Uh, and I was a little disappointed by the second movie soundtrack. Um, the I was also disappointed. Almost like every other scene in that first movie plays that really cool theme for Gypsy Danger. And in the second movie, they play it once. But whenever they do play it, it's really cool. And they play it whenever they're starting to rebuild all the Jaegers for the kids to hop in and take on the oncoming threat. Um, the original Pacific Rim was a like passion project by uh, Guillermo del Toro. He loved anime. He loved giant monsters. He loved mecha. And he wanted to make this movie. Um, and he went ahead, he, he got the funding for it. He got to make one of his dream projects. And, uh, and because of that, you can definitely feel like a lot of passion in that movie that I, that I really appreciate. Um, he and another director, uh, Michael Dougherty, who did Krampus and Trick or Treat, those are, those are directors to me that no matter what they do, even if the movie is like bad, they have, you can feel that they were passionate about what they were doing. At least you feel that passion coming from the screen. Um, and I really appreciate that about all of Guillermo del Toro's stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and unfortunately by the time that that movie was wrapped up, uh, he then was waiting for a long time to do uh, Pacific Rim uprising. He had like a sequel written and a sequel planned and it was taking forever to get in production, and he told Legendary Pictures, I'm going to go make my fish movie. He made uh, The Shape of Water and won an Oscar for it. And he was like, 
and Legendary at that point in time was like, well, we're actually ready to start making this soon. So are you sure you want to make your fish movie? And he was like, yes, I do. And uh, so they went, fine, then we are reducing you to just a producer and we're going to give it to... He was the showrunner for the first season of Daredevil. Um, I can't remember his name right now. Uh, Alexander DeKnight? Stephen DeKnight, I think is his name. Um, he... He, first off, season one of Daredevil, unrelated, is amazing in my opinion. I thought that that was a very well done series. I agree. Um, but uh, and then he went into this, and he definitely brought something different to the action and the way that it's done. Um, I think the fact that there's more daytime fights because a lot of people complained about the first one. Almost all the fights are in the dark and with a bunch of rain. Um, the daytime fights are definitely. Uh, a, a bonus, in my opinion. I think that is cool that we do finally get to see these monsters and Jaegers in a bit more lighting and action. Um, and so I, I kind of like his direction a little bit, uh, but I still don't think he was as passionate about it that as uh, Del Toro could have been. And I think if Del Toro had been attached, we might have gotten uh, a little bit more continuity from the last movie. Um, because Charlie Hunnam's character is just completely missing. They don't, they don't even mention him, I don't think, in the second movie, like what happened with him, um, which I think is a little bit of a missed opportunity. Uh, but uh, that second movie does have a lot more Easter eggs, though, for a fan of the genre. Um, there's this uh, entire screen, this display, with all these different profiles of monsters, and... They all are various kaiju from other films. You've got Gigan in there from the Godzilla series. You've got Gamera. You've got uh, Mogura. All sorts of random monsters are on that screen, and that's, that's like a fun little Easter egg. Um, they, they turn Mount Fuji into this plot essential thing, and that is the coolest thing ever to me because... Mount Fuji is in the background of almost like of tons of Godzilla movies, tons of kaiju films. And it, it was always just kind of there just for the heck of it. And in this movie, it's because the kaiju are like uh, bombs, essentially. The, they're, they're, they're all heading towards Mount Fuji constantly to essentially climb into the volcano and set off a chain reaction that will... Uh, terraform earth for the aliens and i thought that, that was just that was a great fun thing that's one of the that's one of the, the 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 handful of things that i just really loved from the second movie uh just had me kind of geek out a little bit uh, yeah uh, I thought, you know one of the things that i liked was like we got kaiju and yeagers in tokyo yeah and <laughs> and there's mount fuji so it's like we actually you know get japan in there yeah, uh, that's a missed opportunity in a lot of our of uh, of the American kaiju films. Is they like the Godzilla movie, the the Godzilla reboots? They're all talking about how he's so centered in Japan, like he came from Japanese testing and the like, and all that. And they're barely ever set in Japan. There's barely any scenes in Japan. And the same with Pacific Rim. It's like. Guillermo del Toro made this movie that is very much based off of Japanese uh, media and Japanese culture in a way. And I don't think there's like a single scene in Japan in that movie. Um, in fact, the, uh, the base is founded in Hong Kong. <laughs> right. And that's just a little weird, um, kind of a missed opportunity on, on his part, I think. Um, but I don't know. I think, Pacific Rim, just both movies are just fun kind of action adventure movies to put on. Either either one, I if you're if you're like a fan of the story of the first one or a fan of the characters, you might be a bit more disappointed by the second one like I was. But I think they're both serviceable action movies, definitely. They're just fun things to put on and you know, you're sitting down to watch a movie about a robot punching a giant monster, you shouldn't expect too much <laughs> right i mean you, know, you go in knowing what you want you want robot and monsters fighting and buildings getting stepped on and whatever and um that's what you get and it's yeah and they're uh, 
I'm kind of a fan of how brutal some kaiju movies can get to be. And Pacific Rim are definitely some of the more brutal kaiju films out there in terms of like the violence. Like they just, they just empty a clip in that one monster in the first movie. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't know why there's something just really weird and interesting about like that kind of destruction on that scale of a monster. Um, and that's definitely the, the original like Japanese Godzilla, Gamera, all of those kaiju films get surprisingly violent and brutal. People don't really realize this, but like, uh, I think Godzilla versus Gigan, Gigan like splits like the jaws of Angerus open and he starts gushing blood out. And I mean, it's the seventies, so it looks goofy, but it, that's surprisingly brutal and no one really realizes this. And I don't think many people try to take that into account whenever they make their own version of like a kaiju or a giant monster. Um, and I'm glad that like Guillermo del Toro and uh, Steven S. DeKnight is, uh, both factored that in for their movies. They went, no, we should, we should definitely include this stuff. Okay. Any also, thoughts then? Well, uh, I was about ready to mention, I also appreciate the, uh, how much of the anatomy they get into, like the, the scientists. I appreciate that it is, it, it does both the military aspect and the scientific aspect very well. In my opinion, I think it focuses on both equally and they are both it, interesting and enjoyable and it doesn't feel like there's too many oh how convenient kind of cliches like oh that person just happens to be there um i i think they're a ton of fun and worth watching for any fan of monsters or action films <laughs> all right well thanks for joining me again um, remember if you enjoyed this video hit the like and subscribe buttons and hit that bell notification so you know when i put up more videos we'll see you next time Bye bye